Hi, welcome to episode 80 of the American Tributaries podcast, where to break out of the bubbles we all live in. We're using modern technology, like a 21st century Lewis and Clark journey, to explore the various currents of people in our great country. I'm your host, Michael Whitten, here in Brooklyn, New York, and thank you for joining me in this exploration of America. Today, I'm so very honored to be joined by Greg, uh, by Greg Gerloff, who lives about 1,200 miles northwest of me in uh, the Grand Forks, North Dakota area. Um, where he was retired as the CEO of a healthcare system. Uh, we were connected by Greg's nephew, Adam, who was an elementary school teacher for both my daughter, Miranda, and my son, Atticus. So, um, Adam, thank you for connecting us. And Greg, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? And could you share a bit of your story? I'm doing great. Let me let me say one thing to the audience. I'm no longer right, residing right now in North Dakota. I'm down in Phoenix, Arizona, taking care of a grandchild. And so... Uh, and she was up most of the night, so my eyes look puffy. I haven't had a lot of sleep going into this, but uh, I'm here today, and I'm anxious to talk to you about where I, what I do and where I come from. I, I came from originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where my, where Adam's dad brought up my brother was raised. But I moved to Grand Forks, North Dakota, in 1970. I worked for a fellow named Ross Perot in the computer industry. And it was very big in the very beginning of the c- c- computer industry back in 1970. We uh, sold online computer services for clinics and hospitals. And I installed an online uh, a system in the Grand Forks Clinic. Now the system was a 33 teletype and an ACR at punch. It ran paper down to a reader down to Dallas, Texas in the 360 megagram uh, computer. You have one in your pocket right now. That big, okay. <laughs> but we did we did patient billing through it, and it was kind of a new thing in, in industry to actually have a computer not on print but online you could use and it printed out all of our statements and bills, insurance bills, and I got to know Ross Pro pretty good. Uh, he was a good man. He's a hard worker. Uh, I'll give you one example: you're we're in we're in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and he wanted to go to Minot. It was that's that, actually called Minot. We called it Minot. And that was like 150 miles away from Grand Forks. It was 9 o'clock at night, but he wanted to go. Now, for your viewers, he was a multi-billionaire. He started his, he started his, uh, his business career doing uh, selling computers, and they went into computer services. And so I'm sitting with a billionaire driving to Minot, North Dakota, and we're going to share a room, and we're going to talk about where this, this program is going. It was just in the infancy. Well, that's how I got to Grand Forks, North Dakota, and I installed the computer uh, and um, computer system, online computer system, and the administrator said, hey, why don't you come be my assistant here in, in Grand Forks and get out of the road system, get out, get out selling computers systems and start working in the clinic in healthcare. And so I did that July 1, 1961, no, it's 1971, I'm sorry. Uh, my dad was in healthcare for 36 years. I was in healthcare for 36 years. I went on. He, he passed away early on in my, with, I worked with him. He passed away in 75 and I became the senior administrator. And we grew a clinic from 24 doctors to 240, merged with a hospital, had uh, 6,000 employees. Uh, and uh, that was my, my business side of the career. Uh, and, I, and they never went back to Sioux Falls. They stayed in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And it, I loved it. North Dakota is uh, is something we say, you can come here, we're happy people, we have diversity in what we do. Uh, the one thing you have to understand, we have cold weather in the winter. And so if you can't make the cold weather the first winter, we understand if you want to move back to where you came from. We're only 100 miles south of Winnipeg. Uh, so I always say, you know, we're a big city and little city. We're a little city in Grand Forks. Right across the border is a, is a, a million people in Winnipeg, North Dakota, which is, is the diversity is fantastic. You're not going to find a more diverse community than you will in Winnipeg. Every nationality, everything, everything you, you would want to get uh, travel to a European country, primarily England, uh, Northern Europe, uh, you get in Winnipeg, North Dakota. They're friendly people. They do have some, some things you have to get, pick up. You have to say, eh? Uh, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Hey, hey, hey. But other than that, they're, they're just like us Americans. They're, they're, in fact, maybe they've been a little bit nicer than Americans. I don't know. 
Oh, I thought um, everybody in North Dakota was very nice compared to New Yorkers too. So well, that means yeah, really my, nice. uh, Adam's in New York. <laughs> I, I went to his wedding there. And, uh, I, and there's a funny story I can tell you about the wedding. I got there and I have traveled, so it's not like a big thing. I got there. And so I, he pulls up to the hotel and I'm going to get out and join our family. And uh, the guy goes and opens the trunk and there's no suitcase. He said, what happened to the suitcase? And I was talking to him a little about, about New York and environment. I said, where's my suitcase? I don't know. You saw me putting in the trunk. I said, come on, man. I said, we drove from the airport to him. There's no suitcase in the room. Oh, he said, I popped the trunk when you were getting the bill. It's inside the hotel. But he <laughs> laughed. <laughs> you thought it was gone. We, welcome to New York. I said, yeah. But uh, yeah, New York's an interesting city. This is back away when Adam got married. I, uh, I have to say Today has changed an awful lot, and uh, I uh, I don't, don't think I'd want to go back again. I saw everything I wanted to see in New York, and I don't think New York is on my list to go to. Um, go back to my life. I married and my first wife. Uh, we were married in 1972, and she passed away from uh, cancer in 2006. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we tried to get it cured down to MD Anderson, but it didn't work out. out. I have one son, Chad, who's now 50 years old, and uh, I was uh, up uh, alone for two years, so I met my current wife. I've been married since 2017, 2013, I'm sorry. And uh, and she has a granddaughter down, daughter down here in Arizona, and I now have a two-year granddaughter at the age of 81. That's pretty good, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I can tell you, for your listeners, they don't get any any different than when they, when, when I had a granddaughter. Uh, which I had a granddaughter when she was two years old. They are a fireball, and you got to keep up with them. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, where do you want me to go? You want me to go a little bit more about my business? What I did in the, at the link? Well, I, I mean, I guess I, I, I mean, I guess I have to jump at kind of like the idea of working with Ross Perot back in like the early seventies. Was he already a billionaire at that point, or was he this had, more he of the? Just, he would when he worked for IBM, and with Ross Perot. He he sold so many machines, the big big machines. His commission was done in thirty days. In thirty days of next year, he had sold enough IBM equipment that he was out of commission. He couldn't make any more commission, and he was one of the top salesmen. So he said, "You know, I can make more money just using these machines and not selling them." So he said, in Mockingbird uh, Mockingbird Lane in Dallas, Texas, he set up this computer system to sell to hospitals and clinics all over the country. He was online, very very. I mean, if I told you that you had to use a nine eight eight uh, keyboard for a, um, I'm blocking now for a, you know, like is it an adding machine at, it, for to put it in the code numbers and the teletype like you saw teletypes you know they would do, 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 mm-hmm, send mm-hmm. out these little strips to put input for for uh, uh, right written information al- alphabetic information you'd say. That was the computer system. That was what we transmitted. Paper tape, like came off of a teletype, that had all the information. We transferred it over a wire, and the wire was really interesting. It was a phone hooked up to a coupler. You put this phone into a coupler, and it sent it down to Dallas, Texas. And, I mean, when you talk about how we're become, right now, this phone we're talking now has more power than 360. So it was like, it was like this was really in the very beginning of the days. Uh, Grand Forks Clinic. That became uh, we, we merged the hospital and, 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 and formed a, uh, a system, uh, all true. We called it all true, and uh, we were we provided healthcare for the upper quarter, the upper north east corner of North Dakota. We had uh, five thousand six thousand employees. We had branches in seven different communities, and uh, uh, it was starting out from a little clinic downtown of, of twelve doctors. Um, that's my my career in a nutshell. Wow. Yeah. So, um, I, I guess first, what what's kept you and and I'll go back to the like, professional questions that are swirling around. But what's mm. I mean, what's kept you in North Dakota all this time? I mean, especially I mean in this day and age, I mean, so many people kind of like move around. Yeah. Um, what kept you there for the you know your entire life, basically? Well, in, in, in Grand Forks, I kind of when with my job, I've been became very involved with the community. I was on the chamber board, economic development board. Uh, the governor had me on his economic uh, board. Three governors actually had me as advisor to his economic board. So I was kind of in the throes of the whole community. 
building it, growing with it, and enjoying it. So just the, the people that I've worked with for all these years, I mean, I could not replace them uh, uh, over the 36 years I was there. I still am there. Uh, I just couldn't replace them with any other job. I couldn't get any other job. And, and as far as as far as Ultra was concerned, we were forerunners of integrating the hospital and the clinic. Uh, that that was a big thing back in in the eighties. Uh, it was it was uh, it was something that more people were doing. Now they're doing quite a bit of it over the years. But back in back in uh, in nineteen seventy nine, that was that was a pretty big thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. They're good people. I, oh, I, I, also, just they don't work all the time. I love golfing, which we have a few months a year where we can golf. And I love hunting, <laughs> deer and, 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 and wildlife, ducks and geese. Uh, that was a real passion. And I love fishing. I mean, great lakes, great lakes in Canada to fish. I mean, it's it's, it's outdoor world of entertainment. It is all there. Yeah. But we will say we always had these doctors come from southern places. They say, well, how do you stand the cold? I said, you have to be friendly with people because you're inside with them for like three or four months out of the year. I mean, there's not a lot of outside activity unless you're a skater or something. Um, but they, I, I always say, you know, you, you, the first year, year you stay, it's on you. I mean, if you stay here for a year for us and, and you, you wear there on, on out, we can, we can be, we can be uh, feeling sorry for you because you don't like the cold. The next year, if you stay, that's on you. Either adapt, <laughs> adapt to this kind of country, that was on you. But we'll help you through the first year. We'll get you going. We have one of the best hockey teams in the country at the University of North Dakota. It used to be called the Fighting Sioux, but we had to lose that name like, like they did in Washington Redskins. But the Fighting Sioux uh, are national championships six times, seven times. Uh, they're now called the, the Fighting Hawks. Uh, if you're a diehard Sioux fan like me, we still holler Sioux when uh, no one ever complains about it. They just, got, they just lost out down the playoffs. But they've, uh, I don't know if you ever look at North Dakota hockey and look at them, see they're one of the top tens in the nation. Uh huh. Wow. So, well, you know, just uh, as I guess as I was looking at, um, just measures of like latitude of like where different places are yeah. and just so uh, and this i guess for for my benefit and then for anybody listening but like you know, new york city is roughly at 40.7 degrees mm-hmm. north and grand forks north dakota is 47.9 degrees north which mm-hmm. is actually like more north than almost like anything on the eastern seaboard that we think of as cold whether it's buffalo montreal quebec city st john's newfoundland where you see icebergs like mm-hmm. you're more north than than all that <laughs> Yeah. Which is really crazy. Actually, if you look at a map, the best I can say is that we're north. You know, you know, World Canada. But if you look across the sea, we're about wherever England is, northern part of England. Yeah. In our yeah. latitude across. So if someone has ever been to England, we're at the very top, up uh, up north of uh, of uh, London. Uh, I can't think of the. I've been to England. I can't think of the name of the, the town. I think maybe you caught me early in the morning. I'm, I'm getting love my. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll think of the place up there. I was gonna say to you, but yeah, we're 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 north. I always say that there are uh, a, a million people that that live north of us in Winnipeg, and they survive. They have worse winters than we do, and they survive every year. So I think you know we're down. We're in the southern hemisphere to them. <laughs> and Sioux Falls is almost uh, it's uh, it's three three hundred fifty miles down to Sioux Falls, my hometown. But they get grass about two weeks earlier than we do. That's a, that difference in the in the weather. It'll be green in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We'll still have and uh, nothing going on up here very much. What's a when? So what's the latest that it, you reasonably expect to have like snow or ice? We're, we're, we we and earliest it can, it can early as earliest can be in sometime in September, and that ruins your duck hunting. And it will go until uh, uh, Easter. Sometimes you hide, hide Easter eggs outside. And you don't want it to snow. We have big Easter hunts for all the kids on a golf course, uh, a couple of holes. But we put them out the night before, and we just pray it doesn't snow the next morning because they won't be able to find them. So that's the way it can go from, you know, from end of September to end of May or April. Wow. Yeah. And then it also gets, I mean, because you're so far north, I mean, compared to like New York, I mean, it also gets darker probably earlier and yes. stays darker, you know, and uh, and the other end in the summer, it's probably the sun's out more than right. we're used to. We're we we are in daylight savings time up there. 
Right now, we're, we're two hours behind. Most places would be one hour behind us. We're two hours behind right now in Arizona. Um, so this is so this is what what they you used to say. There's actually a bill that went before the, the House of Representatives about daylight saving time, and they say and then here see, here's the here's some mentality up here. If it's too much, if we expand their sun hours, our children will be outside playing too often, and they'll be tired when they go to bed. And we might be more, we might have a harder time being influenced by the Communist Party. Okay, that was someone wrote that. Is that the Communist Party, because our children will be so tired, will, uh, will you know, influence them or whatever, whatever. But yeah, it is, it does get darker and it stays darker. Uh, it's not, a, it's not unlikely when it does go to work at seven o'clock in the dark, you come home at seven o'clock in the dark. Mm-hmm. And so that's unusual. Yeah. But the people in North Dakota are very friendly people. They're diverse, as I said before. We have everything but pretty big manufacturing. Uh, we have some really large manufacturing in some areas, but they're farmers by the most part. And, and uh, uh, that's the biggest. Uh, egg culture is our biggest commodity. And then, then, then sports, hunting, and fishing. Uh, a lot of people uh, in, in North Dakota are artistic, authors. Uh, uh, we have three great univer- we have the university and a state university, uh, th- three other colleges, private colleges. So we're only eight hundred thousand people. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's it's not it's not a big a big state by any means at all. Uh, I was religious. looking at Manhattan the other day from uh, our building has a view of downtown, and I was looking at the the island of Manhattan alone has like one point five million people yeah, on that one little island. That's it's crazy yeah. how different that is. Yeah, our biggest city is Winnipeg, and then next would be Minneapolis uh, that we we travel to. Northern part of Minnesota and the northern part of north north the eastern part of north of South Dakota are very very much alike. And they're in the and, and we have a bit more farmland and less lakes, but pretty close. You've been in northern Minnesota, you've been to North Dakota. Um, we don't have any skiing there, we don't have any big hills. We have one one little hill, but it's really a mountain, not a mountain, but a hill. Uh, hockey is a big sport because it's always cold. Uh, and just good people, very, very religious people, a lot, a lot of diversity in what religions are. And I was going to talk about the migrants. We've had we've had we've had people from South come up and harvest our crops for years. And I tell you what, they are the nicest people. They get special permits to come up and help us do the sugar beets and hoeing and everything else. And you get to know them. We had clinics all over set up to take care of their health care, but they're really nice families. They assimilate very well into our community. I know there's a lot of immigrants coming in from different countries, not just Mexico uh, or Latino countries, but they're, they're, they're by and large, they're very nice, very religious, very faith-oriented and family-oriented. And I know that there are, like anything else, there's some bad people. There, I don't know, you probably won't believe it, but there's some bad people in Chicago. There's some bad people in New York. There's some bad people in Minneapolis. Uh, you know, there, there's some bad people in Los Angeles, uh, and and we still, there's still our states, you know, still, you know, but I know the immigration is a big question. We're not, we're not hit too part, hard up here. The ones that come up here usually come across the Winnipeg border. Uh, they're not so much as the deep, or, you know, uh, southern southern countries. Uh, they come through the border. But uh, we've had some, uh, a few immigrants come up to North Dakota, and they have family up there for those years and integrate pretty well. I know it's a, it's a, more complicated in other areas. I'm just trying to say there is a good part to this. These yeah. immigrants are coming across. Yeah. What um when what's the what's the harvest season like? How long is that? Usually starts well. Hopefully, it'll start in May and runs through mm-hmm. August, September. Okay. And you had mentioned beets. What are the other crops that are corn, popular? wheat, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, soybeans? Soybeans mm-hmm. is, is a touchy one. They, you got to get them in the ground to get a frost. They, they get killed off. So usually they're uh, they're crop you don't plant maybe 10, 15 percent. Mm-hmm. Corn is real big, and soybeans are real big, especially in the valley mm-hmm. uh, where the soil is richer, mm-hmm. and that's a big money crop. Corn's probably yep. the next the big money crop. Mm-hmm. We have wheat, rye. Mm-hmm. Um, 
those are the basic that we that we grow okay um and then for some reason i guess i'm thinking i think of like mining but is that south dakota or is that uh that's in south dakota that's that south dakota that the black hills where the gold came from and okay we don't have we have oil though okay we, we, a lot of oil exploration we have a we have a whole bunch of oil under our state and that's all on the west side western side of the state from williston which is in the north uh west corner of the state all the way down into the into the badlands um mm-hmm. uh, uh, so we have a lot of oil out west and not so much oil in, in the grand forks here the first half of the state uh north to south doesn't have any oil the second half of the state the uh, north to we- northwestern part of the state has oil mm-hmm. and so it's a big a big a big product now up here oil yeah. and there's always t- how to transport it and all that kind of stuff's going on but there's a lot of people multi multi millionaires oil on their land. I have a little bit of oil, and uh-huh. just a, I tell people just a little bit. But you, uh, you have a little oil well. Yeah, I have a little bit of line that has oil wells on it. Uh, and I get a check every month, and it's kind of nice check to have. It's bigger than my Social Security check. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm fortunate there. But yeah, that's. That's the oil is a big economy in, in North Dakota now. Yeah. So I guess I'll ask just because you're you're there and you're actually connected to it. But like you know when I think part of some of the I think misunderstanding between people and places is like kind of like you're in a different setting, so there's different priorities, different values. So like from somebody who ha- doesn't have oil wells anywhere near him, when people hear about oil drilling, they're like, oh gosh, that's going to be bad for the environment. Obviously you live there and you, yeah. I mean, you have to both make a living, but you also, you know, this is this land that's your land too. So like, how is there some kind of balance between like, I guess taking exploiting what is there to be able to take care of you know yourself and your family and your okay. community, and make sure that it doesn't do the I guess worst thing the bad things that people think mm. of when they hear about oil drilling. Yeah, I would say you know we're, we're not as we're, our people are, are not we we have we have people that are of different opinions about different things. We are basically a uh, middle of the road, if not Republican state, in, in, our, in our, our thought processes. We're not radicals. We're not we want to save the planet, but we're not marching around with science to save it. Save it. We're trying to save it different ways. Uh, but as far as oil is concerned, most people benefit from it. Our taxes are very low because of it. We don't, you know, uh, it's brought booming business not only to parts of the western part of the state, but to the our side too, in regards to healthcare, we have a big expanded healthcare system out there. Uh, so most people benefit from it. But like anything else, you have naysayers. We have naysayers about fishing our lakes. We should not fish our lakes. We should not shoot the waterfowl that go through our land. And you can you can talk all day long about you know you need to harvest in order for them to to, to reap better. If you if you let every duck live in the world, we would not have any ducks that have diseases and they'd be gone a long time ago. And they, they would starve to death. You get to harvest them in, in order to, for the others to survive. And uh, we don't shoot them just to kill them. We like to eat them. Uh, have you ever had a duck? You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I okay. love duck. Yeah. yeah. Well, in New York, this is, it's very fancy in New York. It costs you a lot of money to have duck in New York. Here yeah. in, in, in North Dakota, we serve up duck pretty cheap. Yeah. Oh. But it's like, it's like a, North Dakota is like, I don't think we have the swings of uh, ideas. As much, I mean, as our people are dug in heels, so to speak, about what they believe is right or wrong. I believe anyone can have an opinion. That opinion, though, should not affect other people' uh, livelihood. And up here, we well, we, we had some Indians, but Native American Indians, well respected up here, and they take care. Of, but we had some going across their land, land and, and they didn't want the oil to go across the land. That we went and uh, freshly smoked on a peace pipe with them, and told them, "Well, we could give them money for their education and their well social social life." Man, they're big big fans of us now. So, uh, so, so it all depends. Going to school? Yes. Have fun. The, my parents that were staying with their daughter going to high school. Yeah, make sure you come back after school now. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, um, I, I can tell you a lot of interesting story. I'll tell you the interesting story is that when we had this health care come out during the Clinton era, uh, Hillary Clinton was in, like, I got a call from the senator of our state, and it was watching Monday Night Football. And he called me, and I said, hello. I said, I, is, is Greg Gerloff there? I said, no, he's not. Can I take a message? Well, this is Senator so-and-so. And I said, oh, wait a minute, I hear him. So I said, oh, <laughs> hi, Senator. I just got you. That was you on the phone in the first place. I was watching football. I didn't know what you were going to ask me. He said, would you like to meet Hillary Clinton? I said, yeah. I said, I'm trying to put people from South Dakota together, or North Dakota together, to talk to her in Minneapolis about health care in rural America. And he said, you, you, you'd you be a good person to visit with her. I said, yeah, it'd be, be interesting. Now, I'm, I'm a Republican, but I, I have, we have two Democratic senators at that time, and I got along with them great. Uh, so we send our senators to Washington, D.C. to bring the money back to the Republican state to spend it, okay? And so uh, anyway, uh, are you interested in the story? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. please. So I went in and sat across from Hillary and uh, at, at, at college. And so she's she the asked, first lady at the time, right? Yes, yeah, she was the first lady. Okay. She was she was selling health care. There was she was going to do universal health care. And so uh we talked about our health care and how we have we have satellite clinics all over and, and we, we covered the upper state, you know, so that people have better access to health care. And so she she was very interested and that's why she wanted to talk to me about our network in health care. But the question she came up with, she said, Well, Greg, she said, This is very interesting. I, what you do in North Dakota. How would you equate or how would you do this in Los Angeles? And it was so dumbfounded. I said, Los Angeles, California. She started to smile. In fact, she started to quiver. I thought she's going to start laughing. And I said, You know, I don't know because it's more complicated. There's every, every social, more, more social stigma out there, more nationalities, more religious structures. So I don't know how you could equate ours. We're kind of all, you know, North Norwegian type people up here, you know, not real diversity in, in, in our religious background. So it's very easy to mold our people into a way, a system that fits everybody. But one thing about Hillary Clinton, and I don't know what your opinion of her is now, but she was a very nice person, nice to talk to. And I, I mean, I, I, I thought she was very charming and, and, and very knowledgeable about healthcare. Uh, now where she is now today and all this stuff, I, Kind of lost favor with it a little bit, but uh, people were interested in what North Dakota was doing in their healthcare because we were we were actually not national healthcare, but we were set it up that we covered a lot of territory uh, and, and provided a big service over a large swath of land and population, large population in North Dakota. But uh, so we do get you know. We do get we do get some kudos for our healthcare system and how it's set up, but then again, we're rural in North Dakota, and we have people are pretty uh, one size fits all and and, be, and how they live their life. Mm -hmm. say. Does that makes any of, sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. Now, <clears throat> you know, one of the like for me, the when I think about healthcare, I think that there is like catchphrases that sound ideal like the idea of universal healthcare sounds sounds very appealing but i think that like when i think about like the realities of like and this is where and i mean just like i've i've always voted democrat um but like i won't vote against you no that's okay <laughs> that's the point of the podcast no but yeah. i but i but i think that to me there's there's there are words or catchphrases that sound appealing but like the reality sounds when you really dig down into it it seems a lot more daunting so like when you hear about universal healthcare like you know maybe that works in certain areas and not in others and i think about the bureaucracy of just schools or the dmv and stuff so when i think about what it would be like to have this huge system i i'm more i guess I guess, uh, and I understanding sounds like it's almost like condescending, which isn't, but I, I can see that other side of people who like might hear that word and it might trigger something negative mm. because they're like familiar with bureaucracies. And I, and I wonder like how you manage that in, in North Dakota and for yeah. yourself being in yeah. a healthcare system. Well, my, my feeling is I'm very strong. Um, I, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a Republican, but I'm also socialist in, in regards to the masses needing to take care of them. Our healthcare system every year gets worse and worse. It's for the rich and wealthy. It's for the employed, 
and, and, and even with the employees, it's very, very expensive today. Uh, I visited England. I went over to England and visited our national health program. And I, I, and I had to tell them how, how ours works and how theirs works. And there are two things that, that they have is that, is that it really is a good system in England. But there are, there's also a system you can go to a, a different, if you have money, you can go to boutique medicine, okay? Hey, Mama. Michelle. Yeah. We need to change this, okay? My power. That's right, 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 right. <laughs> hey, I'm on, I'm on this deal here. I want okay. my power. I'm going downstairs, follow me, okay? <laughs> a guest, we have a cameo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the two-year-old's up, <laughs> but I can go downstairs here. Do you follow me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Looks, so far, so good. Um, <laughs> but the more I see healthcare and where it's going today, we need to change it. It's gotten way too expensive, and people can't afford it. So I'm all for a socialized program. Uh, uh, right now, I think it'd be the best thing to, ha- to, ha- to happen. In, in in England, like here. Um. Okay, I gotta figure out some place to set this up now. Okay, I can do it right here. Um, oh, okay. Okay, I can put it here. How are we doing? Are we okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Was, so far, so good. Connection still okay. on. I mean, there it is. It's well up here. And you got New York City behind you. Yeah. Yeah, it is New York City. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Where are we at? Where are we at in the viewing here? All right. How's that? that looks good. Looks looks good. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Healthcare is getting more expensive. It's uh, it's getting more selective to where physicians will go to work. Um, we're fortunate that we ha- have it all to one house up here in, in North Dakota, because people like to have you know three or four neurosurgeons, not to have one being on call every day. We can have three or four neurosurgeons that. Can work our whole system, but um, you know, here's, I'm stuttering here because I, I tell you what our problem is: our government, and, and it's not it's not the, the Republicans in some ways are just as confused about what we need here as the Democrats. We don't have a, we don't have a government that can say we'll actually set something up and work together and do it. And I I, I really wonder where the Two parties are fighting all the time. What kind of healthcare system they would set up? Back back in my time, we were Republicans and Democrats. We got along just fine. Like I said, we had two, we had a governor governor with a Democrat. We had two senators of government. Um, I had a, 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 a friend that was, was a secretary of uh, health in North Dakota. Earl Palmer became a con- congressman. He was one of my best friends because he was involved in healthcare at, at roots in North Dakota. And then he went on to become a congressman. One of my best friends, and and now we have all Republican people in, in office. And uh, but back in my day, I worked with the Democrats. That's who 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 were in, were in, in political positions in North Dakota. Um, but we need to do something uh, about healthcare costs. We need to have something about making sure there's a healthcare for everybody. In some of the rural communities, there's not much healthcare. Mm-hmm. I mean, why the why the small communities are are closing their doors is not because they don't have an economy to work for the grocery store and the gas station and implements the dealership, but it's because we don't have health care and they got to drive a hundred miles for it, really? or more, one hundred fifty, and that's where they're not their kids can't come up. I mean, it's just that they don't have rural rural health anymore. Uh-huh. So for North Dakota, rural health would be really good. Um, the healthcare, it's the, I, I can't. You mentioned New York. I can't imagine there's all kinds of healthcare in New York. Um, the word, the word clinic, we we use the word clinic in North Dakota. Like this word, doctors work. And if I use the word clinic in New York, it'd be a free clinic. It'd be like a, a welfare clinic or a you know, mm-hmm. homeless clinic or something for the poor. So it's the, the terminology is very diverse throughout the country. Yeah. Well, we need to do something different. The one we have can't, can't sustain. <clears throat> it really can't. And, and uh, where I was a, a proponent for not, and Henry Clinton, not having universal health care, today I, I think universal health care is what we need. Really? 
Yeah. Well, can you, so you know, one of the things that I, I've noticed is that um, I feel like sometimes there is there's a push for like expensive solutions to things that aren't necessary. And I, and I say it's like more like, say I'll, I'll use a simple example of like, say like my dentist, like I visit the dentist, I brush my teeth most of the time. I floss most of the time. And then they'll say, well, you know what, if you use the, you know, a, uh, you know, what? a battery water powered pick? toothbrush, well, yeah. first they get a battery powered toothbrush yeah. and then they say, okay, and then you should use a water pick. And it's always like, it becomes more and more complicated, more and more expensive. Whereas if I just stick to brushing my teeth and floss, I feel like I'm doing a good enough job, mm. but there's another part to it, which is I hurt my back and I went to a, um, I went to a doctor and he said, okay, you know, but well, it's okay, but you, we're going to send you to PT, you know, physical therapy for you know, 10 weeks and you got to do this and this. And I was like, look, doc, like, um, I just left my job to start this not for profit. I don't really have the money to pay for physical training. And he's like, okay, well then just do this stretch, uh, every, every day. That's it. So I was like, so I just dodged five thousand dollars or whatever it was worth of you know physical therapy right. when all I had to do is like one exercise. So I feel like sometimes it's more like either the ex- more and more expensive treatments, or I don't know if it's like unnecessary, but kind of like it, not necessary. I, no. I, so I don't know if that if that's. I mean, obviously that's just one thing, and it's a far more complicated thing, but my perception is sometimes it's like, you just got to live healthy. Like he's a thousand different diets out there when the key is, you just got to put less food in your mouth. And I've never succeeded in doing that, but. Yeah. Well, we have, we have a, a very, you know, and we, the people, we have good health results, mm-hmm. but if you look at our third, some of our third world countries, some other countries, they have even better health results. Mm-hmm. You know, in, 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 in Japan, they take care to, they want you to be healthy. They take mm-hmm. care of you, make you healthy, not sick. They start yeah. from the premises that we want you to be healthy. Right. We start from the premise that we get a click when you're sick. You right. Know? We, so we want the solutions. Yeah. Well, the solution is uh, we should go into more, you know, environmental issues, eating issues, exercise issues, and we wouldn't would have all these sick people. But the other thing is our medicine is based on a click. If we were based on taking care of people and you don't get paid when they come in sick, you get paid to keep them healthy. That, right. That's that's what most of the countries do have. And yeah. That's universal health care. Yeah. You want to make sure they get immunized and all that kind of stuff. That, that you don't want them to come in when they're when they're sick. And ours is based on the wrong. I, I had the health care for thirty six years. And mm-hmm. I try to say our health care system is ass backwards. Can I say that word? Yeah, you what yeah, most that's third world other countries have. Uh-huh. England has a has a social program. Uh they love it over there. I actually went over and gave a talk about ours versus theirs and what the difference is. And right now I couldn't give that talk because they do queue, you know, they do stand in line. Uh, they're, they're used to queuing. They do have a time when they go and get their physical and get their health check. But it's, if you do it every year at the same time or twice a year. And and they, they don't let you get sick to come in. They take care of it in the beginning. The rich, if they don't like it, they can buy all, you know, alternative medicine. But the majority of people are in their, are in their social socialized medicine. And it's worked well for them. Here, you know, if you're poor and you can't get in, uh, there's some programs for you. Yeah. But, you know, if you had a insurance policy where the first $5,000 you paid out of your pocket and you made median income, you couldn't, you couldn't afford it. Yeah, besides, yeah. The, besides the premium you're paid for, anything over $5,000 or $10,000. So yeah. they don't come in, and they get sicker, and they, they actually cost this some more uh, and to take care of. Yeah. Oh, wait, do you, do you have a – is there a – Door or anything because I hear your granddaughter. I just yeah. don't know if she'll hey, just hey, be too hey, distracting. <laughs> okay. if, if she can't, that's fine. You, I understand. I, but hey, hang on a minute. You want to go on another little trip? This is sure. <laughs> I went. I went down to the lower level for this open stairwell. I gotta apologize. No, no, well, no. Let no, me okay. ask you what. Let me ask you what is your background from Sioux Falls? What did you do before you started podcasting? Oh well, I've I've had a. Uh, I grew up not far from Brooklyn. I grew up on Long Island, went to college in Philadelphia, was in the Navy for four years, stationed in Japan, and then uh, was uh, I went to law school. I was a lawyer, and then after eight years of doing that, I just couldn't personally, the hours were just a bit too long and unpredictable, so I got into wine and spirits distribution. And I've been doing that for the last uh, 14, but it was two years ago when I just was tired of the 
I don't know, all the the social and political tensions and wanted to do something to kind of, I don't know, be the, maybe my own little solution to it, which is why I started the podcast, just to start getting people to talk. So what did you do when you are in the Navy? Uh, so I was an officer on a cruiser out of Japan. Wow. Well, so. I, uh, I got into the middle of uh, the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah? And my story is, when I talk to you about things I've done, some uh-huh. of them are probably just the fate of life. Uh-huh. I uh, joined the Navy Reserves. Can I get a pill here? Okay. To get out of ROTC. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. So they paid me. I, got, I had to go on a two-week cruise uh, every summer, so I didn't mm-hmm. have to get a summer job. Uh-huh. And I didn't have to march ROTC. And then Vietnam came along. Uh, mm-hmm. My goal was to be Corbin in mm-hmm. healthcare. So, what do you think they needed in 1970, uh, 71, 72? Corbin. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, unfortunately, yeah. So, I got pulled in for two year active duty. Uh-huh. And so, but I was not doing well in school. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, it woke me up to see life and death. And, you know, the struggles other people have. Yeah. So it was a good two-year venture off of college. Went back and graduated from college. But it was a good, good two years for me to grow up. And where were you Where were you sent? Well, I went, went to court school in Great Lakes. Mm-hmm. And I, my first job was at neurosurgical ward in Great Lakes Hospital. And I said to the chief, what do I have to do? And this is this what I'm saying to you. It's sad. I don't want to go to Vietnam. And people are coming back. He said, "You got to be, you got to be so exceptional that we don't want to lose you here." I said, "How do you do that? Work day and night. Just work your shift up in the ward, become senior corpsman of the ward, then work, then work uh, at night in intensive care, volunteer. You know, work at different places and volunteer." So I actually eight to eight to twelve every eight eight in the morning to twelve o'clock at night. I worked. Walk wow. across at eight, and Saturdays I go out and find a bottle of beer and a core wave and have some fun and go back to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sad thing about it is, and uh, they, when I was all done, they gave me a, 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 a special recognition mm-hmm. for the time I spent. I went to Corsco too, but it was an honor. But I felt so bad because I did it because I didn't want to go to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And it was like it was saying like, <clears throat> how should I say it? I, I I I was I was I did a lot of good things, but maybe for the wrong reasons. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's always kind of bothered me because I saw my friends come back from course school to our hospital that didn't do as well as I did. Mm-hmm. You know, from the war, some didn't come back. Uh-huh. So yeah. you were an officer in what kind of ship were you on? Or boat? I should a, say boat because that always correct me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a it was a cruiser. So at that time it was a it was revolutionary because it was a, a vertical launch system. So usually when you shoot like missiles, like particularly like in if you were, I guess you're more like missile defense for the aircraft carrier. Usually the only way to shoot missiles was to shoot have them rise out of the deck, go onto a rail, and then it got pointed um, at the, whatever was incoming. But ours was a vertical launch system vls which meant that they the missiles would just come right out, straight out of the hull and just go whatever direction they needed to so it was uh the uss bunker hill cg52 the vertical swordsman um and i was i was not involved with that system but you know i learned a lot probably I, i'd say probably as much by failure than not because it's difficult to manage people and manage technical things and i, I think i learned a lot uh <laughs> by mistake um, but it was an invaluable experience. And, you know, I, I think that kind of actually brought me to um, this a little bit and this uh, this idea and the American tributaries, because I kind of felt like when you're in the Navy, when you're on an aircraft carrier, and I guess in any part of the military service, but you see it more glaringly, like when I visited the aircraft carrier we were assigned to, um, where like everybody's interdependent and everybody's interconnected and you, you kind of realize that and you feel it and you don't really have the luxury of 
like of being too disagreeable. You don't have the luxury of really kind of cutting people out. You don't have the luxury of being too dogmatic because mm-hmm. you, you have to get along and you realize that you know, even the captain of the ship is dependent on the most junior sailor because that could be the, you know, that could be the lookout that misses or sees the, you know, the iceberg or whatever. Right. Um, and I think that that's maybe one of the things that we've lost in our society is this idea that we're all interconnected and interdependent and we don't have the luxury of like not listening to people. And I, and I think that's across the aisle, across the board, um, yeah. whether you're left or right, um, we have to learn how to listen to each other and stand in each other's shoes and realize that this whole great American experiment depends on all of us and all viewpoints. That's very true. That's very, you said that very well. That's why you're taking these podcasts. <laughs> no, it is very true. The one thing people will say to me, and I'm going to be 81 this year. Mm. What What's different? I said it's the people just don't. They're not as as um, I don't want to say American. They're just not. They're not. They're not uh, working together. Whatever. Whatever it would be. Uh, there's so much conflict and stress and and opinions uh, that are. That's etched in stone. We had a few opinions etched in stone, but not that many. Mm. Uh, so I think it's, it's diverse. The Navy was really eye opener for me. I went in with a two years, two and a half year college education, and uh, for some reason that was important to them when I went in because they made me head of the core school unit. But uh, I, I saw life. I saw what happened to people that, that supported this country and went over to Vietnam. I know Vietnam was. Not a popular word, but when they came back and and they couldn't sit up in beds and they missing limbs and and their they their brain disorders because of trauma, I mean it was like whoa these people we owe them something you know they didn't ask to do this and it, whether the government was right or wrong they went over and did what they were told to do and that's what America is about when it comes to our military and I I went back and into society uh, entirely different viewpoint. And I, I think if it weren't for that, I wouldn't be where I am today in medicine. You know, I, I mean, I learned so much in, in medicine and healthcare in those two, two and a half years. Um, so to me, it was a godsend because that's how I ended up, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you were at, so you were in, um, like, you were really in information systems at the very beginning, the, the technological revolution. And I think that's, to me, like one of the, explanations for what's happened is you know we have become so revolutionarily interconnected in the way that we never were before and i think that in many respects a lot of the tensions are out there are completely understandable if you can go from you know having to deal with the you know 20 30 viewpoints of the people closest to you in the community where you're more likely to be alike to all of a sudden being able to access, you know, millions and billions of viewpoints and then having the forces out there who are trying to get you emotionally driven to do one thing or the other. So if you, you know, want, they want your vote, they're going to show you everything that's going to make you want that vote, whether it's stuff that comforts you or things that outrage you and they don't show you the nuance. Um, And I think that that's what's out there. And that's what I want to do with the podcast. Like, you know, sorry, but like just talking with you as a, you know, as a Republican, and, and this this podcast is not intended to kind of go into politics, but more about civics. I think if we're going to do anything, you know, hearing somebody who says they're Republican say that they favor universal health care is like, you know, is, is mind blowing. I just uh-huh. and, 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 that, and that put you on the spot. But I think I think that there is there's so much more complexity out there. And I think we're so willing to kind of pigeon whole people are so inclined right. to do that and you know there, there's things in new york that you might think i'd be in favor of but i'd say i think we need to pause we need to pump the brakes on it we need to think more carefully or i see downsides it's um and i think that's the case for most people yeah um no, no i like like i say i'm a registered republican but i'm really a middle liner i mean two of our senators when i was active were both were both democrats and my friend Earl Palmer, my congressman, was a Democrat. Our governor was a Democrat, Dr. Uh, governor Center. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I worked up with a, a lot of Republicans in my work area, and that's like, but all the people I worked with in government over those years, a lot of them were, were, were Democrats. We had a flood in Grand Forks in 1979, in, in, in uh, flooded our oh. community. And the Democrats are the ones that bailed us on out in, in mm-hmm. Clinton. Uh, did more for a community than 
I don't think any Republicans could have. Mm-hmm. So we're very fortunate. And people, I think people, you know, like yourself, people who serve this country, serve for the country in whatever capacity, they have they have a greater stake in it. They have a feeling of of uh, of the country, you know, be proud of our country. Uh, and today, I, I just don't know. There's so much loss in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess, you know, um, time will tell, but. What do you? How do you stand the immigrants down south the border coming across? What's your? I I think it's I, I mean I think it's complicated. I mean I, I I don't mean to punt on it, but like you know my wife immigrated from Taiwan. Her and her family did, mm-hmm. um, and I think that there's. I think there's two uh, there's two sides, but I think that's multifaceted. I think that there's a noble idea of saying you want to give people opportunity. I think there is the other side of it to just like looking at the numbers and say how much can you sustain. I think that there is the realism of that there are nefarious forces that will take advantage of like getting across the border, and then there are people who really need it. And yeah. I, I I think I'm. I'm more, I think, opposed to the idea of people using an issue to kind of keep people divided. And I think when yeah. you were talking before about people kind of trying to solve healthcare, right. I, I'm I'm tired of people taking issues and refusing to compromise and keep and keeping that as a you know an inflammation point so that they can raise money. So yeah. I think that's what I would say is it's complicated, but we should solve it as best we can and move on to more problems because they're <laughs> they're more out there. You know, it's not like we don't need additional people. Our population growth is not not on an upturn, yeah. and we need people. I mean, we use these people for a lot of things. I mean, uh, and, and they're they're very my and not all, but most of them are very good family members. Good, good you know, good moral families. Good, they're good uh, religious people. Mm. And I, I, like I say, I I know there's a place we can fit them in our our country. Mm. Uh, but we need to find a find a better program to do that, I guess. Yeah, and I, uh, I think that, and I think that to me, what is what comes across where this becomes a political sticking point, I, th- I think, is that also, I mean, there are plenty of Americans that are suffering, but there always yeah. will. There's always going to be yeah. some, but there are people that are suffering, and I don't think that they get the. I don't. I think it, if you were, if you're suffering, if you're having a hard time, you're gonna feel like you're not. Unless it's fixed, you're gonna mm-hmm. feel like you're not getting enough attention. So to take this idea of immigration and oh, we want to help people, and then people who are suffering who don't feel like and may very well not be getting the help they need, yeah. is it's an easy issue to kind of exploit to just like dig your heels in and say we're not going to compromise on this because you know I can use this as leverage. And I think that to me is the problem is with all this stuff is that people just are using they, they're using people as leverage to not agree on stuff and to continue to raise money. I don't yeah. know. That's I, I no, that's true. So the thing is um, we gotta turn it around and said we, we these the we, addif, additional workers will add to our environment of economic wealth and, and, and that can be spread more to those who need help help it add up. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, is that uh, I would I, I actually and I I don't have it, to say, but the wealthy people who have manufacturing companies and large large farms as a, they should want these people to come in. Mm-hmm. They should give them a hand up to get back in the workforce because mm-hmm. they need them so badly, mm-hmm. and they should give up some of their wealth to see if that happens, and not to not to, to, to demean those that are in the social programs. Uh, that they need to understand this could be better for them too. If they can't get up, rise up either. These people rise up and help them with mm-hmm. with their with their cost. But it's a very it's a very complex story. Yeah. One thing about when you get older, you you when, like I am. You have to think it's some someone else has got to fix this problem. I can maybe still identify problems, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to be around long enough to fix anything. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, no, I, and I guess that's also like one of I, I I look at this as far as like the podcast is I'm trying to model for my kids the behavior that I hope they'll have, which is I want them to be aware of the not just the wider world, but this country and how complex it is and how okay. different it is, and be able to 
one process viewpoints from different areas, but also to realize that it's always more complicated than you think. And I, and I think that that's maybe it was the result of the pandemic. Maybe it's just a result of living in a, a big city that, you know, I love New York, but in some respects, it kind of uh, it can, can limit you as well. So it's such a it's such a dense place to live that sometimes you just don't want to leave or you can't leave. Um, so you stay. And if you stay or you get you get stuck here, you forget about that most of the country and most of the world does not live like New York. <laughs> so, right, no. I, I, so that to me is like, if I, I don't, yeah. I think less about what my viewpoint is and more about the process. And that's, I think what yeah. I want, hopefully if my kids are seeing this and are at least aware of daddy's crazy um, project is mm-hmm. that, you know, they he tried hard to reach out to people in different parts of our country and learn about, the, the mo- many, many, many facets of just this country, much less the world. So I'm going to ask you a personal question. Sure. You, you do really good in the pod- podcast here. I mean, I'm really, really impressed with your your abilities. Uh, can you earn a living doing this? No, no. <laughs> uh, there might be ways, but I think um, I, I have a full time job. Um, and I guess the way I look at this is that as long as I keep it detached from any kind of income source i can do whatever i want and yeah. have conversation like I, I and i think that's what's most important is i've been trying to build bridges i guess by reaching out in unexpected directions like through my kids <laughs> fifth grade teacher <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i meet somebody from north dakota and i think that's the beauty is like there's like there's this element of randomness that mm-hmm. I, I love and i love having the excuse of saying hey i'd like to learn more about north dakota yeah. Well, yeah, in North Dakota, you know, it's like it's 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 kind of very similar to Midwestern states. Mm-hmm. I mean, South Dakota uh, and North Dakota, there's probably not a lot of difference between us two. We may say a a bit more, maybe a little bit more Canadian mm-hmm. uh, in their infrastructure, but um, you you know, if you look at Minnesota, Minnesota, North Dakota, with the lakes and stuff, I mean, we we could be the upper upper half, northern half of Minnesota, it'd be almost exactly like North Dakota. Mm-hmm. Only when you get in a different, different, different environment is when you go down to cities. Uh-huh. Where, I mean, even the Minnesota people say, we don't, we are not the cities, and the cities say, we're not Minnesota. Yeah. We don't have that in, 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 in Grand Forks. We're not that big to mm-hmm. have that many different philosophies. Right. But I don't know. It's a, uh, so what, how old are your children? Uh, I have a, a daughter who's a senior in high school, Miranda, and then Everett's in, so she's in 12th grade, Everett's in 8th grade, and then Atticus is 6th grade. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. It, so. But you heard my little granddaughter. Yeah. yeah. She's two years old. Fireball. Yeah, adorable. Yeah, I know. Uh, and we came down here to spend two weeks with more. Her mom and dad are out on a, on a cruise, so uh-huh. it's kind of unexpected. But this is going into our second week. And I tell you, when I had this podcast this morning, I said, man, I got to get to bed early. Hopefully, McKenna will (laughs) will agree with that. Um, So so can I ask another question? I know you probably did through listeners. Now, how did you know know, uh, Adam from out in New York City? So Adam was was Miranda's fifth grade teacher. And then uh, he was also then uh, my youngest, Atticus's fifth grade teacher. Okay. So um, I'd actually, I think I'd asked him actually to be on the podcast too, because I'd love to, you know, talk okay. to educators and other people that I think of the more like public servants um, who are kind of really, I guess the essential workers that we talked about at some right. point, we need to really kind of live that a little bit more and pay more attention and give more respect to them. Um, but he, uh, he was, I guess, a little bit hesitant about doing that, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> which many people are, um, but he was very helpful in connecting us. That's good. Adam's yeah. a great person. I we were out to his wedding. I told you about my deal in New York. Really, thought I lost my, my yeah. suitcase in the cab. But no, he had I, the wedding he had was just fantastic. It was you know there was a, a lot of Koreans in it, uh-huh. dressed in it. Mm-hmm. You just I, I'll never forget that experience that I that I did. They were just lovely, lovely people. Yeah, was it in Brooklyn? Do you know? Was it the, the, it the was wedding? right? It was right across from Statue of Liberty. Oh wow! The, the, the you walk out over the ocean there, and you see the Statue of Liberty. So that's where it was. Um, uh, the the Koreans they dress beautiful. 
Yeah. I mean, it was like, I mean, it was just done by their, their that was, everything about them was like, wow. Yeah. This is really, this is really a wedding that people should, should attend to see what, what, a, what, a, what a wedding in there. Their deal is. It's like yeah. it's really, really great. Yeah, that's yeah I haven't talked to Adam very much, and I actually don't haven't talked to his dad, my brother Scott, very much. Uh-huh. Uh, we've been kind of isolated. My, you know, Scott went on to be uh, work for the Historical Society, mm-hmm. and and you know, and I have to blame myself for that. When I went to I went to school at University of North Dakota. I went to business school. I could you. I took a course in ancient history, one course. I mm-hmm. loved it so much. I went all through Rome, Egypt, mm-hmm. uh, Middle Ages. I had I had as many hours in history as I did in business school. And all of them, I took summer school to get some of them in, or to race track. But so I told him, I said, history was my life, not business when I left. So what do you think Scott did? He went down <laughs> and took a, got a major in history. <laughs> and so that's how he got into the, you know, into where he is now, historical society. Uh. So I thought, gee, my dad said, why don't you tell him business? I said, well, he loves history like I did. So uh. it's kind of interesting how we choose their past yeah. and what happens to us yeah. uh, when we go through life. Well, I'm, I'm a, I was a history major, and I'm also going to be looking for a guest from South Dakota. So maybe <laughs> yeah. now, I have to talk to another girl off. When I say when I say history, they say, "Well, how was the Civil War?" <laughs> I, I know nothing. I think the well, earliest I got was up to when Christ was crucified in, in the Roman <laughs> history. Okay, yeah. Uh, but everything else, Egyptian history, all of it was like you know ancient history as I studied. Yeah, but it, it does show to me a, a lot. A lot has changed, but a lot hasn't changed in regards to how people still had the task of having to eat and drink and have relationships with their families and everything else. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, we haven't changed all that much. I mean, yeah. sometimes to the worst. Well, I listen, I, um, is there any other subject you want to cover? No, I, I think, I mean, I, I think we could go on for, for hours, but I'm, you have a, a granddaughter to take care of, and I have an a, a, a appointment that I should get going to. But um, before we finish up, can I ask, like, what gives you hope at the end of the day? My granddaughter, two years old, new life, new generation. Mm-hmm. The ba- people are basically good people in any walks of life, you know, and, I, and I've seen all walks of life. I, I I'll say this is that um, I lived up in a, in a wealth, other end of society, you know. My dad was, was had a good job and made good money. And I was around people, the country club set and everything else. Uh, when I came out of the Navy, I had a whole different viewpoint of what people, who, who make up, who makes up this world. And I think the core values of America are still strong. I have faith in it. Our political system is a little bit too political now, but I remember when Democrats used to go out and Republicans used to go out and have dinner. There's still some of them in Congress. But I think we need to get back to more centrist uh, government. Um, I, I don't know about the candidates are running for it. I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of Joe Biden, but I'm not a fan of who the Republicans got up either. So I don't know. We need some middle-of-the-road people, not extremists on either side. Uh, our younger people, um, I worry about their work ethic a little bit, you know. They've had so much handed to them. I think if they went back to the days where, you know, you get a job and when you're in high school and at work, I don't know if I'll ever return, but some values are lost there. And they're, in our religion, also some values have been lost. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm a Christian, but I have good friends that are Muslim. And although we have different ideas of, of God and where he came from, we still have the same principles and values uh, by and large. So, I mean, I think we can be diverse culture and ethnicity, and we can be a diverse culture and religious. And I even think we can be a diverse culture in what we do for a living. I, I always say this story, and I have to say, I, I was a member of a country club. And I was a member of the Bun Bar Social Hour. The Bun Bars were the people who brought the, lo- the, bag- the lunch bags to work with them and were there every night and, and having a good time singing and, and uh, buying each other drinks. And yeah, the country clubs were kind of more snobbish, you know. You know where I'd lock my car when I got out of it? 
at the country club. I never locked my car when I went in the bun bar. Those are good people. <laughs> Mm. I mean that's a <laughs> that, that's a that's a dichotomy of people don't understand that we should have the bun bars, meet the people who work for a living, meet the people that you know got to got to sit down and do a budget every day at the kitchen table, and yeah, we should see where the affluent do what they do. They're good, a lot of good people. Sometimes they got their head up, whatever it is. But uh, diversity is important for a person, and I hope if you have a your children get to see both sides of the street, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, if I had to choose a side of the street, you know where I'd go? One bar. Mm. The real people. Yeah. Uh, they they are your friends. They're real people. Uh, you don't need the fancy cars. You don't need the fancy clothes. And, you know, we play we play pool there just as much as I played uh, golf. So I'm my my idea is that we should become more centrist and our ideas of what's what's good and what's proper. So, oh. But I enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. Like, I'm glad we could hooked up. Sorry, but I'm laying in bed right now. Sorry <laughs> I didn't set things up better and have a computer no. and stuff. But it's been interesting talking to you. And uh, I'll catch your podcast more often now. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, yeah. this has been a, a real pleasure and a, a privilege. I, I appreciate the time you've taken and, you know, the persistence in making this happen. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And thank you to all the listeners and viewers out there. May you go out and explore our country with curiosity, respect, compassion, and humility. All right. Thank you very much, Greg. Bye-bye.